All right. All right, y'all, come on. We got lots of food and lots of murphs tonight, so we're good. <laughs> Amen. I just skipped my part tonight. No, y'all ain't going to get that lucky. All right, everybody on the inside. Hey, we're getting ready tonight, and people are getting tuned in, and we're always glad to have Jim and Seth and Rhonda, and glad to have every one of you in here. And so tonight, we've got a, a very specific word tonight, I believe, uh, for the church, for God's people, as we move forward. Uh, I want to I want to tell you today that that uh, you know there's plenty of news out there. There's plenty of there's plenty of junk going on. Everybody's got plenty of, plenty of junk and plenty plenty to look forward to as far as stuff, you know. Um, and 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 it does us good. <clears throat> it does us good to testify to these things. To realize what's going on, you can't just remain ignorant about everything. But one of the things that you'll notice, and it's it's the truth of the Bible and it's the truth of of all creation, is there's an enemy out there that that causes havoc. Isaiah fifty four says God created the destroyer to cause havoc. So there's always going to be havoc. I've been looking around here all day today trying to find testimonies of Christians that lived during the 10 years of the Great Depression. I wanna, I've want i heard everything that was bad. I've heard how dusty and dirty and dry and broke and out of work, and I've heard all those stories. I wanted to hear testimony of how some of God's people made it through those times. I want to hear. I want to hear somebody tell. Well, it's out there. There's there's some testimony to what's going on, and the good news in all this, whether we have it easy or we begin to have it a little bit rough, it's all about the testimony, and not the testimony of the preacher, not just the testimony while we're in a pile. It's the testimony outside when you get up in the morning, and you begin to realize the presence of God in your life. You begin to see the hand of God first thing in the morning, and it becomes a way of life. Christianity is a way of life. It is living in the presence of God. And and so if we would begin to testify to what's really going on in our lives, not testify to our destination, you can't prove to anybody you're going to heaven. You know? I've had people owe me money that swore they were going to pay me back. You, can, you can't prove it till you put the money in my hand. You know what I mean? So it's, don't, don't testify to the outcome. Testify to the reality. So we've got one of two things going on in our lives. Either there's nothing going on or we just fail to testify. One of the two. That's going to be the big core of my message tonight. It's been a pretty interesting day, but the last few hours have been real interesting. And I want to share some things with you tonight. The testimony. Cindy, God heal you up here last Sunday night? Mm. Yeah, if you were here, that's not for show. The Holy Spirit totally overwhelmed her. Uh, you, you asked me in there a while ago, you said, why'd you, why'd you get me up? <laughs> so they'd know it was him. See, I've been through all the phase of the courtesy drops and all that stuff. I've had people who come up here for prayer, and I knew they were going to hit the ground before they got up here. I used to have a little bad habit of backing them up to the hard floor before I prayed over them, just to see if they had guts enough to try it. <clears throat> see, I, I'm on a deal in reality. So when I put my hands on Cindy's throat Sunday night that was swelling up because of something she ate or something she did, God began to heal her. And when I know not how to pray, the Holy Spirit will take over in utterances unknown to men. And pretty soon the presence of God becomes so overwhelming that you can't even stand up. 
Testify to that. Testify to the presence of God, the healing power of God, the truth of his word, and who he is. If you know that, then whatever comes, whatever's coming down the pike, you can look at it with a grin, and you know that your God's for you. He's with you. He's not going to lie to you. He's not going to leave you short-sheeted, short-handed. God will do everything he's declared he will do. And it will accomplish, his words will accomplish everything he set it out to accomplish. We just got to testify. Let's pray and we'll turn it over to the Murphs here. Lord, I just want to thank you tonight. I want to testify, Jesus. Not testify today and to pick up 26 years ago. I want to testify to 26 years. 26 years of you revealing yourself in my life. In the little stuff, the big stuff, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you're here. Now, Lord, I got a special request tonight. We got a lot of people that are waiting on revival. But, Lord, I know revival's been here since you rose from the tomb. Revival's been here since the first Pentecost. Lord, your word said that if we shrink back and don't acknowledge you, that you won't acknowledge us. So tonight, Lord, I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice, many already know this, Lord, that we vow not to shrink back, but begin to give testimony that drives back the darkness that you would lose that you would lose the presence of revival. That, Lord, whatever we've done to hold things back, that we would drive out the darkness, that we would testify to your light as your people, God. So, Lord, we bless you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all the time you've given us. Thank you for so many blessings in our life. We glorify the name of Jesus, your name, Lord. The name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's enjoy a little worship time. How about a praise offering for the Lord tonight? You know, when we finally trust God to operate in our life all day, every day, it's impossible to be ungrateful. It's impossible not to be thankful for the assistance that the creator of the universe provides to his children in so many aspects of our life. If it's impossible to be ungrateful, then praise should be the meditation of our hearts. If that's the meditation of our hearts, then that should be the sound of our lips. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, when we were here for our little conference at Passover, we talked about, I forget which one of them was talking about, whether you're a one, two, three, four, five, six, and I think it's the number eight. When you got to be an eight, God became, it's because he's the air you breathe. When you're thankful for every air, for every breath you take, and just the little stuff, and I began to testify to that. And as I have battled my own battles and battled for our country and our children, our children's children, most of you that's been around here, you've had, you've either been on the battlefield with me or you've had to sit here and listen to it. And you, you continue to look and you go, God, I know, I know this. This doesn't have to be like this. And if it does have to be like this, there's got to be a purpose in it somewhere. But, God, I can't help but think if we missed the boat somewhere, what can we do? Where do we go from here? We've been preaching to the kitchen table now since Moby Dick was a minute. We, we believe in the institution of family. We believe in families being centered around Christ, but also 
be in the center of Christ. We believe in put, putting our faith not just in prayers, but just realizing that walk, that flow, that walk. When you realize that, though, you got to also realize that there's several different things going on. And one of the things that when you're a, a body that's seeking the truth, our little sign out there has been there for 20 years. Loving our neighbor and seeking the truth. Well, sometimes it's hard to love your neighbor and look like you're seeking the truth, and sometimes it's hard to seek the truth and look like you're loving your neighbor. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so the the truth thing has always been the, the bullseye. Taking a long time to get where we are and see what we're seeing and know what we know. When you come to an understanding through all the Bible studies and things we do around here of the the way God had it set up, the way it's still set up, where you have Babylonian models, you know, and then you have kingdom models. The kingdom model truly is the kingdom of God. One of the problems in America and across the globe is man has tried to imitate the kingdom of God forming forms of godliness, denying the power thereof. We get trapped in the Babylonian models where you put somebody at the top. See, I didn't know the first time they introduced me to Amway that that was a Babylonian model. <laughs> that you put a guy at the top and everything at the bottom gets sucked upwards. It works like a vacuum cleaner. So we have institutions that operate that way. I got to be careful because I'll get angry at the institutions and pretty soon I want to take my lips, my tongue, my fists, my feet and knock them down and beat them up. <laughs> Some days I just want to beat them up. And the truth of the matter is for God's people, you just need to recognize. I need to recognize. You need to recognize what's the wisdom we follow, what's the direction we follow, who do we follow. Are we being trapped into a Babylonian model? Are we on a journey to be owned by Pharaoh? Or will we be a group of people who absolutely trust the king whose name is Jesus from daylight to dusk that he becomes the air we breathe in the little thing? I love when John shows up because every time he shows up, he tells me another story where he's been testifying at the restaurant, at work, with his employees, and different things. He testifies to the reality of God. This morning on the way to work, uh, no big, this is just little stuff, but it's God's stuff. You got to recognize it. Saturday, they had me pray at the, or they don't have me pray. They they know I'm gonna pray, so they. But at the horse sale up there Saturday, and I didn't think anything about it. Just start praying. So I prayed, and I said, "Lord, we're a bunch of agriculture folks here today. We're out here in the West Texas and the Panhandle." And I said, uh, "I know you got your hand on the spigot." And we can tell you've turned it a little bit, and I'm just asking you, if you just turn that song gun to the left just a little more, and let's, if we could have some more, I'd ask you to allot us some more. That's just how I prayed. No big deal. A guy in the crowd who's an agriculture guy that lives in Clarendon sent me a text this morning, or, or a voicemail, and he said, don't have to call me back. I'm sitting in my office watching it rain. And I remember your prayer. And I want to thank you for praying. I want to give thanks to God. And I'm praying for him to open the spigot at your house. Now, what happens when we all start acting like that? So this morning, I pray in the sail barn like I do every Wednesday. When we first started doing that, Murph, and we'd have to kind of wall them in there. And now guys that used to deal me a lot of grief are standing there with their hats in their hands before I ever 
get started. And we prayed, and I prayed for rain. And I got done, and I, I said, hold on a minute, Charlie. I said, I want to testify. So I told that story to all them guys sitting in there this morning. And I said, I just want you guys to know that we just got done talking to God. And he heard us. And it's going to rain. He said it would. And I just want to testify to that. I should have been testifying like that for 26 years. I thought I was because I was a preacher. To testify because I'm a human who's been given the grace to be born again and to live in the presence of God. This morning I had some old goofy roping steers cut off and going to take them to the sale and a couple of them were longhorns. I don't know if anybody knows anything about longhorns, but they're demon-possessed. <clears throat> they're crazy. And so anyhow, I've got them sorted off and I'm down there and I've got... Steve's been to my place, but my pen where I load is kind of big, and so herding cattle from a big spot to a little spot and making them get in the trailer, you got to be as athletic as a border collie dog to get that done. So if you'll put your hay racks in the wrong spot, you just look like a voiceless idiot out there trying to load these cattle. So I'm whipping around on them cattle and trying to get them to move and trotting around the round bales, and there's nothing going in the right direction, nothing. Well, I'm just fine. I'm not, I mean, it's fine. But I, out of my mouth, I said, Lord, surely there's a couple angels around here could flap around in front of them cattle just a little bit and give me a hand. That's just what I said. And I turned around, walked to the house, get Robin to come down there and help me push them steers in. And when we walked down there and opened the gate in the pen, they're all standing in the trailer. I told Rob, I praise the Lord. I told Robin, I said, that's why I had to bring you down here so everybody knows I wasn't drunk and I'm not lying. The one I didn't want to go in the trailer was in there. Yes. No. Remember? Yeah. No, there was five steers in there and there was one I didn't want to take. He was not in the trailer. I thought there was another one I didn't want to take, and she's kind of become dangerous, but because I'm from Oklahoma, unless the steer is completely wore out, I just don't sell them. But we quit roping her because she's dangerous for my favorite partner. She's standing on the trailer, and I told her, I said, let's cut that one out. And it wasn't going to happen, and I told her, I said, no, you know what? I believe God knows a lot better than we do. She needs to go to town. She needs to be gone. And so load them trailer. And, and you know, when you, Murph, when you walk up to a trailer with some cattle, if they was in there by accident, what's the first thing they'd do when you come up there to the gate? They'd run over the top of you, wouldn't they? They were all just standing up there in front of my little trailer. They were all just standing there staring at me. I couldn't believe they was in there. I was kind of come wallering up there to do the gate. Nobody moved. I preached a sermon one time with a herd of longhorn cattle in the arena. True story. While I was preaching, the whole herd turned around and looked at me and stayed there and never moved the entire sermon. Testify. Did you have a testimony before 7.30 this morning? You see, this is what I want to talk about a little bit tonight. I started to title this little deal tonight. Leonard always wants a title. He always tells me, he said, what's your title, boss? I said, that's it. I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to hear it. <laughs> Not really, but 
I, I started to title this tonight, Destination Preaching. Because now for decades, that's what we've done. We've testified to our destination. We've testified to heaven. And you can't prove to one living soul you're going to heaven. There's no way you can make a non-believer believe that you're going to heaven other than they just accept what you're telling them. Most of you wouldn't have any idea where you were going anyhow. you never been there. You'd have more of an idea about hell than you would heaven. We've lived a lot of it right here. So we've had that hellfire and brimstone preaching, and we've t- preached to a destination. And along the way, we forgot to preach covenant. We, got to, we forgot to preach a bilateral agreement. We didn't need the Old Testament anymore because we're going to heaven. Pretty soon you've got false doctrines and theories about absolute truth that are simply about beam me up, Scotty, and get me out of here. Because I read the end of the book and we're the winner. Well, you say amen. Let me tell you, when you win this thing, Every day. Not at the end of the book. Today. There's something going on today. It may not be a big thing. Dusty, he had a big thing today. He had hip surgery today. Come through that real good. Doing good, yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord. He's praising the Lord. He's half drunk on whatever they give him, and he's praising the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people having heck. And then there's some of us that the biggest deal of the day was my steers got in the trailer. Still God. Still God. But there's two ways of doing this. One is an earthly model. The other one is the wisdom that comes from heaven you see if we just testify to a destination how can you testify to your wisdom do you know what we've done we have trained ourselves in such a false sense of humility that we don't have enough confidence to even claim our wisdom you should see your faces how many of you actually believe you're wise enough to give advice You should. You should. There's a wisdom that comes from heaven that we can testify to. I had two options loading them steers. I could have got a bigger whip. I could have used cow words and they might have got in there. I might have danced around that round bale till I had a heart attack. Then we could have had a real miracle, you know. No, there's a couple ways to do things, and it takes a long time to kind of figure some of it out. But it's really tricky when you're in this world and you're not of it. And in James chapter 3, first place I want to go tonight, verse 13. James chapter 3, 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. What he's saying here is, if you got your own personal agenda, don't justify yourself by twisting the Word of God. See, I'll give you a really good example. It's kind of difficult around here because I got a lot of agriculture guys that I hang out with. Agriculture is a tricky subject, isn't it, Sheldon? You uh, nowadays you got to have help to survive. Sometimes when you read the Bible, it says, "I look to the hills from whence my help comes." My help comes from the White House. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we had a pretty good discussion on this yesterday morning. 
The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. So that means everything is mine mine, and everything yours is mine. Because I'm in covenant with the owner of the universe. He owns it all. But if I have to partake in Pharaoh's wisdom and his direction to receive, if I have to compromise my beliefs, if I have to go against God, see, now I've fallen in the trap. These are things that need to be talked about openly. We don't talk about these things. I asked the guys yesterday morning, I'm going Tuesday morning to talk to the New, Me New Mexico cattle raisers. They've asked me to talk. Now, if you're in the agriculture business today and you're trying to survive in the midst of a drought and you've invited me to come talk, apparently you want to hear something from God, what would you like me to say? Do you want me to give you the wisdom of survival according to the book of man? <laughs> or do you want me to come and give you the wisdom of God? Because I can do both. And I'm not ashamed to say so. I can do both. There's a way to momentarily survive what's going on. And there's a way to glorify God that easy but it's that hard so what do we say what do we talk which wisdom do we use i don't care if you're running a restaurant if you're building cabinets i don't care if you're running a cattle outfit or what you're doing on down the line if you run a horse sale i need wisdom from god so i can testify to god does that make sense so he said, if you're self-seeking and bitter and all that stuff, then this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Confusion. How many of y'all think this life in this earth is getting a little more confusing? Anybody agree with that? Why would you think that is? You think people are becoming more self-seeking? You think everybody operates in their own agenda? Why, why would you think? Because it's demonic. So if the Bible says that the light pushes back the darkness, but the darkness seems to be gaining ground, and I'm going to use some things out of Uvalde here in a minute to testify to the light. How many of y'all have heard a lot about Uvalde? It's all been testimony to the darkness, hasn't it? How many of the reports are confusing? Why? Because people who report, report on behalf of the Father of all lights. They don't want to testify to the light. And so he says then, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The wisdom of God. You know, there's a good chance that in my lifetime that we could actually face a, a food shortage globally. You have 1% of the people that feed the other 99. And we have a pharaohistic spirit in the land that wants to control everybody. And so you got all this stuff going on, and we could have what's known as a famine. There have been famines throughout the Bible. I don't know why that would 
surprise anybody other than we've just had it too easy. Anything that pops in your mind you think they'd like to have on your lips, you can go down to the store and get it. And two minutes, you're ready to roll. How many of y'all in the last three years walked through the grocery store and sometime during that trip you said, huh, there's a lot of stuff missing. Yeah. But then you go read the story of Joseph. And there was a guy who could testify. He could hear God. He had interpret the dreams and testify. And because of that, he was taken to the king's palace. Pharaoh. God's man was given access to everything that the Pharaoh or the Babylonians or pick whatever kind of entity you want was all theirs. And he was able to give wisdom that came from God. He was able to survive being exiled, put in the dump, and the whole nine yards. He survived the lust test and the mammon test. And he was used by God to restore his family and feed everybody in the midst of the family. How did he do it? Godly wisdom. He was able to have insight from God, and he was not he was fearless to testify. So we have Joseph. He was obedient to God. It's one of the scriptures we've been talking about here lately a lot, Deuteronomy 28. For those of you that hear me, obey my words, and you're obedient, I'll bless you in your flocks, and your herds, your kneading troughs, your vats, your fields. I'll bless you in your coming in, you're going out. I'll bless you even in the fruit of your womb. But if you don't, then I'm going to curse the same. We've got to we've got to obey the voice of God. Here's what we've done in Christianity. We've separated the four gospels from all the rest of the Bible. And we've watched Jesus walk in the flesh in an effort to train our flesh to walk like Jesus. It's the truth. The truth of the matter is that God is spirit. He's spirit right now, and he's always been spirit. And for a short period of time, he put on our clothes to fix the deal for us, to do it perfectly because we're so imperfect, and to bring us into covenant with him who's been the whole time. He's the creator of all things, so he's not a New Testament entity. So... When we get into all these different things and we become the New Testament church and this and that and other, and I've been listening to a lot of things here lately just to kind of see what's going a little haywire. We totally lose the character of God, who he's been the whole time, how he prophesied to nations and communities and gave us warning and said, hey, quit doing what you're doing so I don't have to do what I got to do. That I could send a guy named Jonah who's disobedient little knothead anyhow and finally things will come around because we heard. Do you know what you do in a person's life when you testify? You just made them responsible for your testimony because I don't know is no longer an excuse. I don't know because you just told me. When we get away from the truth of Jesus as creator, what happens? Romans 1 is very clear on it. When we get away from that, to know who God is from beginning to end. Murph and them sung about it a minute ago, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. He's everything in the middle. He's Jesus who is, who lives and lives with us now. So when we've been brought up in a world that's inundated with Western culture, Christianity, of a faraway God in a faraway place, and the only way to get there is six guys drop you in a hole, it's just not true. And we should testify, not to our destination, testify to our relationship, 
what God's doing. How's God, how are we going to have a testimony? By walking in the wisdom of God. This morning, Robin walked in and said something. She sees some stuff that I don't see. And another chicken house burned down last night. If you've ever mapped that or watched it, there's chicken houses burning down all over the country. Yeah, you huh? No, but there's a lot of different agriculture things. and But I just, you know, chicken nuggets fixing to go up. You're going to be the same price as diesel one of these days. <laughs> we'll never make it. <laughs> uh, and she come and told me, and I don't mean to be rude or complacent, but I just told her, I said, sweetie, there's not one thing that happens on the face of this globe, not one thing that happens in heaven or in earth that God doesn't see and God doesn't know. He's an all-knowing God. Even though he may love the chickens, he knows there was a fire. He didn't miss it. Now, everybody that's going to tell me about it, I stand a 99.6% chance that they're going to embellish somewhere in the story. Would I not be wise just to listen to God? If I'm curious about a chicken house, why wouldn't I just ask God about the chicken house? See, I wish you could see your faces again. This is the kind of relationship I'm talking about. This is what's necessary. Kind of relationship where you can walk through your barn and God taps you on the shoulder and says, I need you to sit down for a minute while I visit with you about something. Kind of relationship where you are absolutely certain you can ask God a question and you will get an answer. That's, that's the blessed life. It's not having five cars in a four-car garage. It's living with the all-knowing God and him living with us. And then whatever manifests, whatever happens, however it goes, operating in godly wisdom does not always mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean that you're going to always win. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have hard times. Doesn't mean you're not ever going to get sick. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through some fires. These things are absolutely necessary. Do you know what came out of, of the Great Depression? A smaller, stronger church. It became smaller because we couldn't afford the trappings of church any longer. It became stronger because there were people who deemed God absolutely necessary. Pretty good stuff right there. The wisdom of God will get us through whatever comes. We should not be downtrodden. We should not be dismayed. We should not be worried or fearful. Yes, we can be aware. But our covenant with God says that I can look at a lion and he will shut his mouth. I can step in the fire and I'll come out the other side and not smell like smoke. I can even die, and if Jesus says, get up, I'll get up, even if I laid there four days. Either the whole thing's true or none of it's true. That's what the Bible says. And then I stumbled on a little deal this evening, because I want to give testimony, read one more thing, out of Revelation 12. Y'all haven't caught me in Revelation in a long time. I'm a little more confident now than I used to be. <laughs> So I'm not scared to step out on the little skinny branches every now and then. But I had an interesting visit with a good friend of mine. He's, I'm very privileged for some odd reason, and he's nicknaming me the preacher daddy. I've got a handful of guys that call me on a regular basis, and we talk about a lot of stuff. And I'm telling you, I'm watching these guys, and they they're surpassing anything I could ever hope for or imagine. 
they're so willing and they're so fearless and they're so curious and they're young. <laughs> but this particular friend of mine, we've been talking for a long time here, growing in spiritual things, worked his way through a lot of theology and different things that he grew up in. And then being called to the front lines of some spiritual warfare and some different things. And and he's walked his way through it, and we've got to help him some. And he finds himself unknowingly in the midst of Uvalde, Texas. There's a tough one. And without even knowing what's going on, he's been speaking to and helping a young man get delivered that worked in the gun store. To the point that my friend spent several hours with the owner of the gun store. I spent a lot of time down there helping some people work through some stuff. So while he's talking to the man at the gun store, the man's very upset, losing hope, he's been lied about, he's had his life threatened. My friend sat down with him and he said, this isn't your fault. You see, the truth of the matter, when you get it firsthand without Fox or CNN or some jack wagon monkeying with it to fit their own agenda, truth of the matter is that gun store made it, never made a nickel off that gun. That guy ordered it online. You have to give a destination address. The address is in the phone book, and the gun came to the to the guy's deal. He never, he didn't even know anything about what was going on and how in the world would you predict that a guy ordered a gun online, walked into your place of business, picked up his gun, and was going to go down there and shoot up 21 or two people? You wouldn't have any idea. And the community is about ruining this guy's life. I don't have anything against gun salesmen. I may want to buy another one one of these days. But I'll tell you the rest of the story here in a minute, and you'll know who's to blame. Because my friend told him, he said, I want you to tell me whose fault this is because they've tried to blame the school. They've tried to blame the police officers. They tried to blame the gun salesmen. They've tried to blame the guns. They've, they've, they've laid blame on everybody. They've went all the way down the list. And he said, you're kind of at the tail of the deal. And he said, they still can't find anybody to blame. But when Satan, who roams this earth like a roaring lion, seeking who he may desire. And some of you, I don't know if you heard my coffee with the colonel from Gonzales the other day when I talked about an orphan spirit. Where a young, empty soul has no identity and can't identify it. We've got an epidemic of that going on. The lack of the ability to identify it. And you fill your mind with all kinds of things from video games on up. When you harbor some type of resentment and hatred towards somebody and all of a sudden you get an idea in your head and there's no conscience to tell you no and, you, and it manifests and here you go. Satan is the enemy. Satan is to blame. The angels of Satan are to blame. The forces of darkness are to blame. Our battles not against flesh and blood, but against those principalities of darkness and forces of evil. That's where we stand. Now, to make room for the darkness, you have to draw back the light. It's a failure to testify. How many of you have heard of a Bible study of students? at lunchtime that have 400 in attendance at school. Heard anything on the news about that? Because four years ago, 
They started a Cactus Jack program. Gunstone owners, one of the three guys. In the first year, they had about 30, 40 kids that came to Bible study at lunch two times a week. If that boy hadn't quit school in the eighth grade, he'd have been in the first Bible study. Now there's over 400 twice a week. That makes 800 would be two-thirds of the school. Has anybody testified to that? Did you hear that on the news? Anybody heard about that? No, because we're trained as Christians that everybody's invited to the Bible study, but we'll not boast in anything. But if you'll follow the Bible, Paul says, I'll boast, but I'll boast in the Lord. This false sense of humility and this shrinking back as a Christian. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you what my Bible says. Let me tell you what Jesus is doing. Let me tell you what he's doing in my school. Let me tell you about 400 kids coming to a Bible study. Let me encourage 400 of you to go to school and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's doing in your life. Testify to what the Word of God is doing in your life. Testify and give testimony. Let me tell you what my God is doing. Let me shut the mouth of the line if he looks like CNN. And let me tell you from my Bible study. Let me tell you from my life what my God is doing. Revival. Revival has been loosed in Uvalde, Texas. And the enemy came to shut her down, and he found one unidentified soul. And he talked him into volunteering. If you'll pull back the light, you make room for the darkness. In verse 12, Chapter 12, verse 1 of Revelation. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven uh, diadems on his head, seven, or like seven crowns. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. I probably don't make a whole lot of sense to anybody, so I'll help you. Let me tell you one thing. I'm not a futuristic preacher. I don't take the book of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, anything above and jump them, leapfrog them over the New Testament so that I can create an entity that's somewhere out there in the ozone that we're going to bump into one of these days. I'm not waiting on the Antichrist. I'm not waiting on the tribulation. I've been looking for 1,260 days for a while. I know where the first 1,260 is. The book of Daniel is really clear. And at the midpoint of the 300 or 3,000, whatever it comes to there, the, the seven weeks, the book of Daniel says he'll put an end to sacrifice and burnt offering. Jesus Christ did that, and it was exactly three and a half years from his baptism to his resurrection. When you read this Bible, it sounds like a woman that's going to give birth to the Son of God, doesn't it? This is all taking place in the theater of the spiritual realm where John the Revelator is sitting on the back side of the island of Patmos, and God is telling him all these things, and he's writing it down the way that he saw it in the spiritual realm. It says now that the church is going to have a time of three and a half years. Boy, if I could ever prove that it was three and a half years from the resurrection of Jesus to the stoning of Stephen, I could write a book. I just had a hard time getting it pulled off. Somewhere down in my gut, I still think there's a chance. <laughs> but here's my point. Because who is it that has taken on the likeness of Jesus. The church. The church. 
So when you look at the foreshadowing and you look at the spiritual depiction of what's going on, as we live out this life on this earth, let me encourage you today, do not sit in church clinging to the back of the pew waiting on beam me up, Scotty. Know that you are the church and you're called to be the church and we're the body of Christ. We're the hands, feet. We're the mouthpiece. We're the full meal deal, baby. We're the ones that are convincing proofs that Jesus Christ exists because of the word of our testimony, because of how we live. He said, look, there's another sign appeared in heaven, a great and fiery red dragon. He's known as the devil. He's got seven heads and ten horns. He's talking about Rome. The institution of Rome, it's the same way that the Babylonians are set up. What's he talking about when it comes to seven diadems or the seven crowns? He's talking about the seven institutions. How many of you in the last two months around here have heard about the seven mountains, the seven institutions that are coming down? That Babylonian model that is set up to control you, destroy you, and own you. But there's a king who has risen who just wants to rule in your life. And give you everything necessary for life and godliness. Verse 7 says, A war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Who deceives the whole world. Where do you live? Huh. How many of y'all ever thought that the church might be pretty bad about testifying about everything the devil's doing? Pretty bad about testifying everything about what God is going to do. Remember, we read the end of the book, we win. What's he doing today? You see, the devil is really pretty short-handed. Oh, he's got a lot of help out there, but he's pretty limited in what he can do. He can deceive. He can create doubt. He can confuse. Where's the confusion coming? In all them empty vessels. Why are those vessels empty? Some of that confusion is happening in the institution of religion today. How does that happen in the institution of religion? That's a great question. Is, is Satan the voice we hear? Have we really driven out the darkness or are we just playing church? What are we, how are we doing this here? Do we testify? Do you know there's gatherings every week where nobody testifies? The Bible isn't even used to testify. We got people that call themselves church. I just listened to one the other day. He was one of them transgender dressed up like the other one. Drag, that's it. I was trying to remember. I knew if something went on the back of a tractor. I just couldn't remember what it was. It's Drag. <laughs> God stood right there in the front and said, God doesn't exist. And they called it a church. Little identity problem going on, don't you reckon? Yeah. That's what happens when vessels are empty. When souls are empty, even while they're going through the motions. See, when he sent them third of the stars down, they all cause confusion. Twisted theology. Preaching out of an agenda. Got one particular preacher, I bumped into some more of his stuff. I just plum quit him about 15 years ago, and I just bumped in there, and there's a new one today. How to be wealthy in famine. Let me tell you about the tithes. Yeah, you dummies follow him right off the cliff. You're going to starve to death. Yeah, 
I mean, it's just crazy, but that kind of stuff like that. And so then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The accuser has been cast down. Do you know why most of us remain silent? Because we continuously remind ourselves of who we were. Me being a knothead does not change anything about God. Testify to Him. He's worthy of our testimony. Yeah, even though my performance could be less than stellar at times, it doesn't change anything about God. He's just all about changing me. That's it. And the accuser, he said, I put him under my feet. He said he's been cast down. See, this is why I think it's kind of a crummy deal, really, when they tell you this hasn't happened yet. But one of these days now, one of these days, yeah, there's 19 little kids in the school. Where's their rapture? You'd think if God was going to swoop down and save somebody, we'd just go ahead and do it on a day in May when, when we could get 19 little kids out there. Let's just scoop them up. Kind of tired of the fairy tale. I think it's time to be the light. We want to save 19 little kids. We ought to do it. We ought to testify. And he says right here, that power has come to us. We don't live in a form of godliness denying the power thereof. We live in the power of the kingdom of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, and we testify to it. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The blood of the Lamb has brought me covenant with God. Covenant with God says that he'll do everything he ever said he'd do. He's given me everything he said he'd give me. And now all I got to do is obey and follow, do my end of the deal, walk by faith, not by sight, and I'm in we're in this together. May take a minute of knocking around. Not going to figure it all out on the first swing. This is a journey. But if you have a willing spirit, you'll start. And you'll start right now. By the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. What that means is they weren't afraid of dying. They did not love their life so much that they would compromise what they know, compromise their relationship with God to get what Pharaoh had to give them, to live with all the benefits of the Babylon, but willing to stand up to persecution, willing to be talked bad about, willing to have your name thrown around, willing to be exiled, willing to be by yourself. One of the things I've been teaching in private, and I say it around here quite a bit, but if you don't learn to do this by yourself, you're never going to learn to do this. Your hardest day, you'll be there. By yourself. When you're really blessed, you, you, you walk around and you're in harmony with your spouse and you're in harmony with God, and that really helps. We don't do this as a couple. We don't have Bible study as a couple. We don't have anything religious at our house. We don't have a designated prayer time. Sometimes we eat, we pray before we eat. Sometimes we pray after we get started. Sometimes we actually forget. I'm not going to that church anymore. We both. Study. We both pray. 
we talk a lot because iron sharpens iron. And I don't want to hurt any of y'all's feelings because you're a great bunch of people. Truth of the matter is, I'm kind of down to one friend. She's the only one that's absolutely got all her time available for me. She's a little short on her side. I've got most of my time available for her. You better learn to do it out on your own. Your own. You better decide where you're at. You better give testimony to that because the people around you need to hear it. They need to hear it. They don't need to hear that you went to church. They don't need to hear that the music was good. That's great. The music was great. <clears throat> but honest and truly, my best testimony is my steers were on the trailer this morning. The best testimony is there's a whole herd of kids have been hearing the truth about Jesus Christ in a place where they've been overwhelmed with disaster. Where hundreds of hearts have been just busted right in half. But the gospel's been told. So there's hope. And there's been seed sown where it needed to be sown. We have to testify to that. And I'm just about done. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And see, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. It's not a good thing that the devil's prowling around. It's not a good thing that the prince of air has been loosed. It's not a good thing that there's evil in the earth. There will come a day, one of these days, when God will wipe this earth of everything that smells bad to him. There'll be a day when there'll be no weeping. There'll be a day when the cobra will lay at the lion's den and or the child will sit by the cobra and the lion and all that. You know the deal. There's a day when there'll be peace and there'll be no arguing. There'll be no fighting. We won't, there won't be a multitude of religions because Jeremiah 31 will be in full effect that everyone will know God will no longer tell each other about him. There'll be no darkness because the light has now overwhelmed and overcome everything. We're in charge of how much light there is in the earth. The dragon has tried really hard to take us out. I'm going to say in the past two decades or three, he's been patting himself on the back a little bit, thinking he's doing a pretty good job. Oh, I didn't get some of you old people, but I got you kids. Huh. Yeah. Well, guess what? The old thing. We're getting a little wind in our sail here. Devil, I think we'll just start testifying about Jesus. Wherever we are. You know what, devil? You just well go get your new playbook because I think the next time somebody wants me to pray for them, if I'm standing in the grocery store or standing wherever I'm at, we're just going to throw down and pray. Now, the only reason I said it that way was to encourage some of you because I've been doing that for a long time. If you hadn't noticed, I really don't care. I don't care what a non-believer thinks. I don't care what some yahoo that just doesn't want to believe in God. I don't care what he thinks or says about me in public places or sale barns or horse sales or anything like I really, I just flat don't care. Listen, 26 years ago, my career was off to a big running start early way ahead of schedule that's why i had some of the immature activity i had going because i was way ahead of schedule 
And then I get saved and I don't drink anymore, and I'm pretty sure happy hour was the tie that binds us together. I went and drank with all the people I worked for. That's how I kept my job. I didn't know that I could trust God with my career because I'm a horse sale auctioneer, and that's a really slippery slope. I hang around in the darkness. How are you supposed to be a brand new believer? How are you supposed to pull this off and keep your job and keep your place and do the desires of your heart and everything now I look back and realize that God had done? How are you supposed to do that and survive this? It's pretty hard not to when you met him personally in the cab you pick up. You can't. Can't outrun it. Can't outrun him. Why would you? When you know what you know and you can't, I mean, what are you going to do? Just stand around and lie to everybody? I'd, if I didn't testify about Jesus, I'd have to stand around and lie to you. And then you look around, and 26 years later, I've had the opportunity to sell some of the best horses that's ever walked in the John Justin Arena. I've had my voice mumble over some of the neatest pieces of God's creation that a man could ever cast your eyes on. I'm not scared of famines or anything else because Robin and I, we just talked about this yesterday. We have built so many relationships almost globally. So many kingdom people we're connected to. Remember a couple years ago, January, I gave a word, know who's for you and who you're for, know who's against you. Just like all of you, we have a lot of people that are for us. God is for us. That wouldn't have happened without my career. They didn't fire me because I didn't drink. Now they hire me because of who I am. They don't hire me because I'm a good auctioneer. I got a scratchy old voice and I'm old. Sometimes I can't even remember what time sale's supposed to start. <laughs> no, they just hire me for who I am. It's the favor of God. Just testifying. Be fearless. If you're where you're supposed to be, and that's where you want to be, nobody, nobody can move you until God says it's okay. Nobody can move you until God says it's okay. And I promise you, he'll tell you first. You'll know. That's only for people who are in covenant with God. And those of you watching out there, if you're not born again, none of this counts for you. That's the truth. So be sure you're born again. Be sure that you're full of the Holy Spirit as much as you can bear to handle. Talk to God. Talk to Jesus. Stop and listen. Watch. And then testify. The darkness is pushed back. The devil's defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. My friend this week testified to a man who was losing hope fast. Felt like the whole world wanted him off the face of the earth. And my friend testified. Testified him to life. Propped him up. Gave him hope. In the worst of times. We got a sheriff in here with us tonight. He gets the opportunity to lay his eyes on as much tragedy as anybody in this room. 
What he doesn't see for himself, he gets to hear about it. We got to testify. This isn't about all the chaos and confusion. This isn't about hiding out until somebody whisks us out of here. It's about testifying. For as much evil as he can see, there's that much more God. It's visible and available. Is that am I telling it right or not, Richard? Yep. If we have eyes to see, the hand of God working in our life every day, we testify. That's all I got today. But this has been really good for me. I just don't feel like hollering and screaming. But I sure want to testify. And I thought about it all day today. <laughs> all right, what can I tell about next? I want y'all tomorrow to do that. Get up in the morning. Be like old John right there. He's like that all the time. What can I testify about next? God, what are you going to do next? Look for the little stuff. Because you'll miss the little stuff while you're looking for the big stuff. What can I tell somebody about next? My favorite time to testify today is I'll get ready to pray. A minute ago, Ransom, his little cousin, drove up to go swimming at our house this evening. Oh, would I love to have everybody sitting around in church? Probably, maybe, maybe not. We're leaning there on the car, and I said, hey, kids got time to listen to a little God story? God loaded my steers this morning. Ransom knows how wild they are. <laughs> He's had them on the end of a rope. I said, you know them two longhorns? I went to the house to get them all. God put them in the trailer. Wow. He said, that's cool. That is cool. I'm going to tell him something tomorrow. I'm like, I can't wait. I got to just. Hey, honestly, if I told him, I said, hey, Cindy came up here Sunday night, and I put my hands on her, and she got healed, and she kind of got knocked out in the Holy Spirit, and I spoke a couple of words in tongues, and, man, it was really cool. I lost him at Cindy came to the front. Not interested. I mean, not that he's not interested, but he just... You get it. When I told him God loaded the roping steers, hey, yep, told him the other day, I said, you tell God which steer you want to draw. I don't think he believed me. It's the little stuff. Things they're interested in. So, anybody got anything? Did you get anything out of tonight? I hope somebody got something out of this tonight. I mean, you really, I'm looking across this room. I mean, you, you people can do it. I mean, really, there's not anybody here tonight that doesn't know what I'm talking about. Y'all can do it. I look around, we got two young girls sit right here, come every week and just, they just lick their lips like one of my colts, just listening all the time. And look at these kids. Like I mean, look. <laughs>